I am very excited to be here today talking to you about Cornell's Climate Action Plan. I'm also happy to see lots of familiar faces in the audience. Um, there are so many people on campus involved in helping us achieve this goal. Um, so thank you all for being here. And I hope to have lots of time at the end for questions and dialogue. That's a lot more fun than rattling on in the front here. So without further rattling, I'm going to get started. Got all the bells and whistles figured out now. All right, I know you've had um, a number of sessions this semester already where you've received lots of great information, background on climate science. Um, many of the issues that um, you know, our changing climate is causing globally. So I will um, only take just a few minutes to put climate change in context of sort of the um, overall sustainability efforts here on campus and a little bit of Cornell's sustainability history and the, um, where climate change fits into that. So I really like this donut economics model. You can really um, get your arms around it, sink your teeth into it. Uh, this is where I have right paid to laugh at my stupid jokes. Should start laughing. Um, so this is sort of um, just a, a simple model to help understand that what, what we're working towards with sustainability is um, kind of between our social and planetary boundaries, a safe and socially just space for humanity. So in terms of the ecological ceiling, we look at these nine biophysical planetary boundaries. And then we look at the social foundation, um, which can be described by the 12 standards identified um, through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Okay. And so we know that we have already exceeded at least four of these planetary boundaries, one of which is climate change. Um, we also know that millions and millions of people in the world are not having their daily needs met. So we have um, some pretty substantial, critical, urgent issues, all of which point us towards the fact that action um, is urgent, both individual and institutional. And I know that you all um, are very familiar with that. Um, you know, as students looking towards your future, um, as staff here on campus, as a mom, um, very motivated to, to act and, and try to guide our, a sustainable future. Okay, so a little bit about Cornell's sustainability history. Um, so what we, we talk often about um, above the fold leadership. So what are the things that you see or others see that Cornell is doing around sustainability and climate action? Um, this timeline spans from 1985 to 2016, in case you can't see it in the back. Um, some of the big sort of newsmaking things back in the late 90s was the first time we signed a public um, statement commitment to the environment. Um, we then were the first um, private entity to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol after the Bush administration pulled our country out. Um, we signed our carbon commitment in 2007, climate action plan in 2009, got off coal shortly thereafter, generated our first sustainability plan, accelerated our carbon neutrality goal, things really started, started picking up. Um, and then finally, at the end of 2016, we took another look at the Climate Action Plan. We reaffirmed our commitment um, to the Paris Agreement with the other Ivy Plus institutions in 2017. So those are some of the sort of the big, the big things that have been going on. But we all know um, that there's, there's a lot more happening. And we talk about this kind of as a under the fold, below the fold. So um, leadership both in projects and actions and the actions of individual people who are involved. So I don't know if you had a chance to, to read those at the, as they popped up, um, but back even in the mid 80s, the campus started with energy conservation. And by uh, 2000, 2001, we'd already achieved a 10% reduction in campus energy use. So the PSCC, the President's Sustainable Campus Committee was formed shortly after the university committed to carbon neutrality. And that is a cross-campus organization. I think that many of you here are involved or aware. Students, faculty, and staff are encouraged to participate. And this is the group that provides sort of the oversight and guidance on our, um, not only our climate action, but our sustainability actions as well. And also relevant to today's topic, um, you'll see, let's see, our first climate action plan was published in 2009, um, followed up by a report in, like 2014, another one 2016. Anyway, the point is that this is a living document. So as we learn more, new science, um, regulations change, we continually try to improve um, how we're moving forward. So focusing in on the, the more specific topic for today, our commitment to carbon neutrality um, actually has three official elements. So it's not only 
um, a commitment to zero combustion emissions from campus energy use, commuting that's by staff and employees, and um, business air travel by 2035. That's sort of the neutrality piece of it. But we are also committed to integrating climate literacy into curriculum and your educational experience and expanding research. And in terms of um, the leadership potential, I already mentioned we were the first entity to privately adopt the Kyoto Protocol um, as a result of student activism. Um, and among the first 100 campuses to commit to carbon neutrality. And again, it was sort of student activism and student encouragement that caused the administration to make that commitment. So we have this great ambitious <laughs> commitment, um, and it, it, is, it is huge. Um, so this diagram, you can probably tell, is a Google shot of campus. Um, this was data crunched by a student intern, and those bars represent the volume of greenhouse gas emissions attributable to the building energy use of each building. So what is the embodied carbon in the heating, cooling, and electricity used by each building on campus? So what's interesting to point out on this chart is that this is not the energy plant. <laughs> That's not the energy plant. These aren't our energy plant. Um, this is our energy plant. So the point is that our emissions on campus are driven by what's happening in our buildings and by our academic mission. So this, this tallest bar is our synchrotron, and these are our science and lab buildings. So that's not to say that you know, when they're doing anything wrong and that we shouldn't be doing those things, of course we should. But it's just to point out that our mission is pretty energy intensive. So we need to be smart about the way we use energy on campus and how we source energy on campus. And I also will get in trouble with our building energy folks if I don't point out that this bar here <laughs> represents pretty much all of the North Campus residential areas. They're combined into one meter. So I want to be accurate. So we have um, this great ambition, carbon neutrality for our Ithaca campus. Um, it's big. <laughs> um, and as this very wise man said, um, we're not going to solve these problems using the, the same thinking um, that caused them. So what are we going to do? All right, so our first step um, after we made our carbon neutrality commitment was to do a greenhouse gas inventory to identify and measure and set the baseline for um, what our carbon neutrality goal actually is. So let me use the pointer again. Um, this spans 2008 to 2016. The dark blue bars um, are what we call our scope one emissions. If you hear people talking about greenhouse gas inventories, so that's emissions from on-site combustion. So it's the natural gas we burn in the combined heating power plant, our fleet vehicles, a couple other little incidental sources on campus. The, the hashed part of the stack here is the carbon that's embedded in our purchased electricity. So the power we get from the grid is mostly generated um, by nuclear, hydro, and some natural gas, a little bit of coal left in New York State. This solid blue bar is the emissions associated with folks commuting back and forth to campus every day, faculty, staff, and students. And this hash bar here is the emissions associated with um, Cornell-associated air travel. And then hanging off the bottom, um, we have some sequestration from campus forests. Um, we actually export some electricity uh, during the peak winter months. And we don't have to account for those emissions. The folks who use it account for those emissions. So we back that out of our reporting. And then coming, we'll see much more of this um, in next year's greenhouse gas inventory update. But we also uh, net out our solar um, and renewable generation. So this yellow line represents sort of the net emissions. And that's a 33% reduction um, versus the 2008 baseline for these sort of specific set of combustion emissions. But there's always more to the story. Um, in greenhouse gas accounting, there's um, scope one, which is our on-site emissions. Scope two is what we purchase from the grid. Scope three is everything else. And so as I described, out of all the possible scope three emissions, what we are inventorying and counting as part of our goal are those travel-related emissions. Um, there are lots of other things happening um, upstream one of which um, that we have recently tried to get a handle on and track as sort of a shadow emission is the methane leakage that happens upstream from the extraction and distribution that's associated with our natural gas use. So you can see, um, I don't know if you all caught that in 2009, we switched from burning coal on our sustainability history slide. 
We switch from burning coal to burning natural gas in our heating plant, which is much more efficient, um, lets us generate both heat and power at the same time. But um, we know that there is some amount of leakage associated with our use of that, that gas that happens upstream, and it's important for us to take that into account um, to understand you know, the risk to campus, the risk to the environment, and all of these things sort of point to the fact that we just need to stop burning natural gas as soon as possible. So once we've identified um, the greenhouse gas emissions, the things that we are trying to, to reduce, um, and acknowledging that also there are these upstream sort of indirect emissions, um, we developed um, an overarching strategy, um, consisting of, first of all, we try to avoid carbon intense activities. Um, if we need to do the activity, can we do it in a way um, that reduces the amount of emissions? Can we do it more efficiently? Once we've avoided and reduced all of those things, um, can we replace our high carbon energy supply with a, a low carbon or renewable energy source? And then for what I hope is a very small fraction of emissions that are left, um, we'll need to find a way to offset those. So we're looking for relatively large reductions in building energy demand. We want to replace all of our um, energy needs with renewables. Uh, we're looking into mission-linked offsetting actions. So rather than you know, buying offsets on a national market, can we actually um, do some afforestation on you know, fallow egg land that Cornell owns? Or could we do some soil carbon um, fixing, those kind of things that are related to our research and our, our own resources? Um, we're also undertaking actions to mitigate these indirect or uninventoried emissions that I talked about. We know that our food and our waste have big impacts um, on the, the carbon, carbon accounting side, even though we don't have them in our inventory, we're taking action to reduce those things as well. And then finally, um, some climate adaptation and resiliency planning. We know some of these changes are baked in and we need to react. So 2009, we published our first climate action plan. Um, it's been updated, as I mentioned, several times, most recently at the end of 2016. And we've honed in on some key neutrality strategies. So I have a list of I don't know, 10 or so here, there are actually more than 60 specific actions in, in the overall plan. I'm just gonna to touch on the ones that have the, the most impact. Okay, so this is essentially that same list of actions that we looked at on the last slide, um, put into perspective of our, our overall emissions. So we can see this, this green bar is representative of the amount of emissions that we think we can eliminate through the earth source heat project, so replacing our natural gas um, power plant with a renewable earth source heat system would eliminate a substantial portion of our emissions. Um, we think we may need to offset most of our travel. I'll talk about that a little bit more with some offsets. Um, these are the emissions uh, we think we can offset through wind, water, and solar power projects. Actually switching, we currently have a steam distribution system to send the heat around campus. Just by switching from steam to hot water, that in and of itself is much more efficient and eliminates a lot of emissions. Improving our building energy standards, so when we um, build new buildings or renovate old buildings, can we make them more efficient? And then finally, um, even if we aren't building or renovating a building, are there projects that we can undertake just to make it more more efficient, ECI stands for the Energy Conservation Initiative. So it just gives you a little perspective on the relative impact of these actions. Okay, so on the um, key neutrality strategy slide, the first one on there was living laboratory. Um, the reason for that is that um, we, the technology part of a lot of these solutions is easy. We know how to make solar panels, we know how to make wind turbines, um, you know, we, we know how to drill holes, um, you know, to, to get down to where, you know, the, the heat of the earth is available to us. Um, but if it's the first time something has been done, either t um, from a technical standpoint or a new business model or in the case of some of our solar farms, um, locally, I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to our efforts to permit the Dryden community solar farm. If things are happening at, at a large scale for the first time. Um, there's a need for someone to be first, right? So we need to figure out not only what, what are the technologies that are gonna work, but how do they scale up? And our campus, with a population, I think there's about 30,000 of us when we're all here, hundreds of major buildings, we use one one-thousandth of all the state's energy, so we're a, we're a good place to try to scale things up, and try them out, find out what works, um, 
and attract some, some partners um, to help us do those things. So we have this concept of a living laboratory, um, and it happens at all, all different scales. So big scale, like our Earth Source Heat Project, which I'll talk about in a little more detail, um, right down to you know, folks in your office. Um, you know, are there ways that you can, um, I don't know, make your office coffee more sustainably or more efficiently? So it runs, it runs a spectrum of what, what can we try here that we can then scale um, you know, either things that you can take home with you or can scale to local businesses, other institutions. So we look at our campus as a living laboratory in that regard. So the second bullet on those key neutrality strategies was thinking about things in terms of a sustainability framework. Um, we talk, I'm sure you've heard of the sustainability triple bottom line, right? Yeah, okay. So at Cornell, um, we started talking about our quadruple bottom line, which is you know, um, prosperity, planet, people, plus our academic purpose. So are there things um, you know, that meet the traditional sustainability bottom line elements, but also either help us to advance our academic purpose or where Cornell is uniquely suited um, to act as that living lab because we have a particular kind of expertise or a particular environment or other resources at our disposal. So we, this is a great way to operationalize sustainability. So, um, and again, kind of like the living lab concept, this scales from really small things you know, what, what kind of um, you know, office coffee maker am I gonna buy, you know, thinking through all of the impacts to, you know, should we pursue earth source heat or a large scale wind farm or some of those other decisions. Um, or if we're doing a building renovation, is it makes sense to put in triple pane windows or double pane windows, you know, suitable. So we have to think through all of these things. Um, and so we've created uh, some resources to help folks on campus do this. These are available online on our website, uh, some informational instructions, and then a spreadsheet that is set up with the, you know, the quadruple bottom line categories, um, some areas of impact to think about in each one, and then some more specific categories um, to think about and, and scale them. So are we making things better or worse in each of these areas by this potential project or decision or new process that we're thinking about? And this spreadsheet and tools also scale. You know, if you're trying to decide which paper clips to buy. You know, maybe you don't need a decision analysis matrix, um, but if you're doing something more substantial, um, the spreadsheet is a good, a good place to start, and it generates some nice reporting tools. Just identifies areas of you know, potential risk, potential strength, helps get some of those conversations going. So transitioning now um, to some of the more specific actions, um, the, I think maybe the third bullet on that carbon neutrality slide was about engaging the campus. Um, this is particularly helpful when we're thinking about avoiding carbon intensive activities. These require people uh, to change what they're doing, um, find a new way of doing things, potentially st stop doing some things. But it's, it's key to helping us drive down these, um, you know, these emissions from how we use our buildings and, and how we're traveling. Yeah, so we talk about this in terms of living sustainably on campus. Um, we want to empower everyone that's here uh, to make sustainable decisions. Um, practice sustainable practices while they're here on campus and potentially even, even take, those, take those home with them and kind of spread the learning. So can people save energy um, at work and in their own living spaces in your norms here on campus? You know, can we find more sustainable modes of transportation? You know, can we do some remote participation, for example, minimize waste? And we have lots of uh, tools and resources to help folks do this, which I will describe to you in a moment. But I first want to suggest, I don't know if this has come up in your previous classes or if you've ever done a personal carbon footprint calculator. It's really eye-opening um, and fascinating. There are many of them. This is one that I, I particularly like, the carbon footprint. Even if you've done one before, it's kind of interesting to do these you know, at um, different milestones in your life as you shift from being a student you know, to having a job, you know, to being a mom, changing jobs, all these things. You know, how far you're traveling, um, your modes of transportation. It's just really interesting to see how the changes that you're making in your own life change your, change your impact over time. Okay, so interesting, uh, Cornell to the rescue here. 100% of staff have sustainability in their job description. Any staff members here, did you know that? It's true. Um, we are constantly working on tools and strategies and procedures to help, help our staff um, do that as well as help faculty and, and students um, be more sustainable and 
save energy here on campus. So a couple of resources that are out there. We have college and unit green teams. Um, say human ecology, um, college of engineering, and CALS have done a fantastic work with this. Vet school is just getting one going as students are always welcome to participate in those. So if you're in any of those colleges, happy to help you get involved. Um, we have office and lab space certifications. Again, lots of energy savings um, can happen in those areas. We run competitions. Um, we have a building dashboard that helps folks see the impacts of their energy use, offer lots of trainings, um, resource guides, and um, try to collaborate with student groups um, to the extent possible. Um, sort of an interesting statistic, a very high percentage, 88% of you as incoming students, uh oh, am I in trouble? Um, have indicated that Cornell's sustainability standing is, is important to you as a, as a decision about which institution to attend, so we take that pretty seriously. I got louder, okay, thank you. We also offer um, management academy training for supervisors and um, you know, lots of tools like the quadruple bottom line, spreadsheets um, that not only um, improve sustainability but we help also as part of sustainability, health and well-being of folks here on campus. So we don't think that sustainability is just another thing and add on to your job but truly a, like a fundamental look at how we're doing the things that we're already doing, not something extra. Okay, so for students, um, I could go on and on. There's a great long list, but rather than do that, I'm gonna point you to this Cornell Guide to Living Sustainably. It's been recently updated, it's easy to find online. Just give me a minute to uh, take that in, if you wanna write down the name of it. Um, so it'll point you towards things like, on the Atkinson Center website, there's a list of all the courses offered on campus that touch on sustainability, um, either directly or indirectly. Um, lots of internships. We have, I think, 10 or 11 positions in our campus sustainability office. You can find those on experience.cornell.edu, things of that nature. Another fun resource is our building dashboard. It has real-time energy use of our campus building, so you can see how much um, heating, how much cooling, how much electricity, how much renewables generation there is. It's publicly accessible, most of our major buildings are on there. And you can actually see, um, to some extent, depending on the sub-metering, the impact of you know, changing your own habits with your plug load, with your lighting, you know, with your temperature settings in your building, if you're able to, to control those. I suggest checking that out. Um, and quick plug, we are hiring an intern to help us convert the dashboard uh, to a mobile-friendly platform. So if this is something that's interesting to you, check out experience.cornell.edu. Okay, and as an example of the kind of impact that you all can have, um, fun fact, so lab ventilation is responsible for about half of all campus energy use. Um, also costs a lot of money. Um, one fume hood is about three households worth of energy use. We have some great programs um, to help folks better manage their fume hoods. Um, actually, we have a full-time staff person, that's all she does. We also look carefully at how the building controls are set up, so those things that you, know, you can't control just by raising and lowering the sash, um, but the number of air changes are those really um, tailored to what's happening in that fume hood, um, you know, sensible temperature settings, and occupancy sensors have made a big difference for us in being able to, to better control our lab energy use. So lots, uh, there's lots of things that you can do, and they, they really do have, have potentially a very large impact on our, our climate goals. Okay, so once we have hopefully avoided doing all of the carbon uh, intensive activities that we can and done a bunch of reduction just by our behaviors in our buildings, um, there's actually a lot more that we can do in terms of reducing the amount of energy this campus uses by taking a hard look at our, our buildings and our infrastructure. And so again, um, our building energy uses are really these two, two thirds of our inventory emissions. All right, so how do we manage campus energy demand um, and how does that play into our climate action plan strategy? So we've assumed, um, please work with me on this people, that by 2035 we'll have about the same demand for electricity, heating and cooling that we do today and hopefully even less. So I think I mentioned the Energy Conservation Initiative. That's a program of capital projects where we 
um, study the buildings on campus and look for opportunities to improve their energy use um, intensity. So how much carbon is embedded in the amount of, of energy that those buildings are using per square footage. So things like um, improving the HVAC um, controls, the building envelope, new windows, those kinds of things. So paying for those, even though they are a good return on investment, is challenging. Um, we have, we know that we need to create, build, and renovate um, high-performance buildings, so buildings that um, you know, are, are well insulated, um, use as little energy as possible. But again, those have typically a little bit higher upfront cost, or sometimes you have to make trade-offs between um, you know, beautiful architectural and a reasonable amount of, of glass in a building. Those are challenges that we have. Um, and then sort of underlying all of this, we're in an area of the country where energy is really cheap. Um, usually that's a good thing, <laughs> but when we are trying to convert um, to renewable power, when we're trying to invest in saving energy, having cheap natural gas really undermines those economics. But we see some opportunities. Um, we think if we can increase the payback period for our investments to a longer period of time, um, which makes sense for an institution that's going to be here for a very long time and is consistent with the way um, we analyze other sorts of building projects, um, we put an economic value on carbon reduction, if we think about um, our emissions as a risk, potential for a carbon tax or carbon charge of some kind um, could have a real impact on our finances in the future. And we also think that we have an ability to reduce the amount of energy that our buildings are using um, regardless of growth. So as I said, our, we're, we're sort of assuming that things are gonna stay flat and that's what um, you know, we're planning for in terms of our, our renewable energy um, generation in the future but we think there's an opportunity to reduce, and here's why. So since 2000, I think we saw this on the sustainability history, we've been working on energy conservation on campus. And let's see, let me point to some features on this chart. Okay, there's a lot going on here, I'll walk you through it. So we start in year 2000, up to what we're forecasting um, through the end of fiscal year 2018. Okay, this is um, millions of BTUs per year of energy use on that chart. And over here is uh, how many million gross square feet of campus we have. So with this, and this doesn't start at zero. Everybody always thinks they're catching me, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, all right, so this black line shows the increase in our campus square footage since 2000. So buildings like Clarman and Gates and Weil and East Campus Research, those kind of buildings. So we have added something like 20% to our, our gross square footage of um, buildings on campus that we're trying to heat and cool and power. Okay, and these stacked bar charts um, represent the amount of energy going out into campus. So it's the accumulation of steam, electricity, and chilled water. So what's really cool about this chart is that you can see from 2000 to 2018, our energy use has actually gone down despite the fact that we have 20% more campus um, to supply with energy. And that's a result of our energy conservation measures. So we've made um, the new buildings are relatively energy efficient and have dramatically improved the efficiency of our existing um, building stock. And so these little, these little squares down here um, tell the summary story. We've gone from an energy use intensity of 186,000 BTUs per square foot per year um, down to 146 in that 18 year period. So that's pretty exciting. We think um, we can do a lot more of that on campus, save a lot more power. That means I have to build less solar farms. Okay, and a fun example of an energy conservation initiative project. Um, we recently relamped almost the entire campus, replacing existing, I know still some incandescents and CFLs with LEDs. Uh, more than 60 buildings, 155,000 lamps and a more than five million kilowatt hour per year reduction in electric use. So I'm gonna show you some photos. Hopefully you're familiar with some of our solar farms. We have five online now. Each solar farm generates about three million kilowatt hours a year of electricity. So this is huge, right? That's a lot less capital infrastructure that we have to um, finance and build. And it has a two year economic payback for Cornell well within our um, 15 year target. Okay, so we have avoided, we've reduced, um, and now we need to replace. So 
how can we meet our energy needs um, with 100% renewables? All right, this is where it gets kind of complicated. <laughs> Um, so this is a chart from the 2016 Options for Achieving a Carbon Neutral Campus by 2035 report, where we took a really deep dive into, um, can we really afford to do this? Um, you know, can we become a carbon neutral campus without jacking up tuition, you know, harming our ability to hire the best and brightest faculty, you know, provide you with excellent facilities and, and all, of those, all of those things. Um, so I'm happy to say that the senior leaders group that worked on this report um, applied a quadruple bottom line analysis, and that was a really fascinating discussion and I think um, led to some changes in, in thinking of a few of our senior leaders. Let's see over here. These numbered um, items in this column are the various technical solutions that we considered um, for heating and providing power to the campus. And what we discovered um, is really expensive. So these are in um, millions of dollars. So the capital costs, like the money that you know, we would have to pay the contractor um, you know, to um, create the earth source heat system for us, um, very expensive. Versus you know, continuing with business as usual isn't going to cost us anything, right? Because we already have it. Okay, what we also discovered, though, is that operating the renewable systems is relatively very cheap, only about half as much year over year, particularly if we take into account, um, remember I talked about the risk associated with those, um, those carbon emissions and the potential for a carbon charge. Right now, we don't have to pay for that, but someday we might. And then, what if um, you know, society really gets a handle on this methane issue, and we have to pay for that too. Um, okay, so suddenly, um, business as usual gets really, really expensive, right? So sort of the, the realization was that if we, you know, there's risk associated with what we're doing, um, you know, not only <laughs> to people on the planet, um, but also to our financial, our financial prosperity and our financial bottom line. So what kind of solutions then can we, can we look at where we might be able to attract some um, outside investment? Right? And those are the kinds of solutions that have, um, where Cornell has particular academic expertise, where there's still some very interesting research and development to be done, where industry partners might want to be a part of that, um, where we can create some economic incentives for the region, maybe some new business models. And so long story short, or source heat, rose to the top after this kind of analysis. And you also want to point out that all of these top solutions include 100% wind, water, solar. That's what WWS stands for as part of the solution. And I'll um, throw an example of working on our solar farms. We have five um, two megawatt solar farms online. We're getting ready to break ground on an 18 megawatt community <coughs> solar farm in Dryden this summer. And all of those have been done um, working with third-party partners that have brought in more than $70 million worth of investment and have been $0 of Cornell investment. So we have reason to believe that um, this model will work. Okay, so here's that wonky chart kind of turned into a pretty picture. Um, this is a diagram of you know, where we hope to be um, by 2035 with our energy systems here on campus. Um, we have our, our lake source cooling facility down here, drawing cold out of Cayuga Lake, sending cold up to campus for air conditioning. Uh, we have a hydro plant. I've got some more details on these in just a, a couple of slides. Um, we have some existing solar for power. We don't yet have any wind online or, or contracted, but I'm working on it. And then earth source heat is our big plan um, so that we can stop burning things to heat the campus. And so kind of bookending the system, um, we have lake source cooling where the water cools campus, and we have uh, earth source heat where the earth is heating campus with a sort of a renewable, essentially endless supply of carbon-free energy. Okay, so lake source cooling um, has been online since the year 2000. Um, we draw cold water from near the bottom of Cayuga Lake. It's always the same um, nearly freezing temperature down there. Run it up to the lake shore where it passes through a set of non-contact heat exchangers. 
And actually, I'm gonna back up because this diagram shows it kind of nicely. So at the there's a separate loop for the water, the cool water that runs up to campus from the lake water. So the lake water comes in and then goes right back out to the lake. Nothing's added to it but heat. It doesn't ever come in contact with, with anything else. And that has reduced by 86% the amount of electricity needed to cool the campus. And of course, uses no refrigerants, which are also very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. All right, and then um, on the other end of the spectrum, earth source heat for heating, um, you know, operating a research facility in a cold climate um, is a real challenge and finding a way to heat such a place without burning something, also a big challenge. Um, but we think it can be done by drilling deep enough to where there is heat um, stored in the Earth's crust that we can draw up um, and then circulate around for, for direct heat for campus. So similar to the lake source cooling facility, the idea is we would um, we have to drill well pairs. So we need to, because we'll be dry hot rocks um, at the depth that we're talking about. There's not like steam or hot water or anything down there that will pull up. It's just hot. Uh, so we will circulate water down and back up. It will get hot while it's um, down underground. We'll bring it up into a heat exchange facility similar to the lake source cooling diagram. There'll be a separate loop of hot water um, that circulates the campus. The two will never mix. So the, um, the well water will just go down and back up. It'll circulate around as will the, the campus water. So we're on, um, on track, we think, to have our first test well done um, within five years. There are some things that we, we still need to understand. Um, we don't know the exact temperature gradient. We don't know the exact composition and porosity of the rock that deep, um, things of that nature. So we are working on um, fundraising, community engagement, understanding the policy and permitting um, around this process, which hasn't been done in this, um, this part of the country before. Okay, so that was cooling and heating. Um, in terms of electricity, it's been interesting. I've personally been involved in project managing the, the solar farms to date, and I can tell you that the technology is the easy part. <laughs> the policy around um, you know, the, the state tariffs and the Public Service Commission and trying to work with the utilities and integrate into their distribution systems um, is the challenging part, but you know, we are making progress. I think the state goals at least are aligned um, with where we want to go, which is helpful. Um, all the way from where you can build them, how you can interconnect them, and how you keep the grass from growing up to shade them. Um, turns out that most sheep farmers don't carry the insurance required <laughs> by the, the solar farm management companies to, to keep sheep there. So we've got um, a research team together and trying to get some grant money to figure that out. Okay, so I promised to talk a little bit more about our hydro plant. It's been there um, pretty much forever, about as long as Cornell. And um, its current iteration, uh, was, I think it was built there in 1904. Um, it at one time supplied all the power for campus and the city of Ithaca. Um, oh shoot, I put my bullets up too fast right now. It only supplies about 2% of current campus load. So obviously our electricity demands have grown um, astronomically since that time. But um, we continue also to improve the plant. Um, did a whole lot with the structure and the interconnect in the 80s. Um, more recently upgraded the controls, rebuilt all the turbines, which increased production by about 20%. We're hoping to do some work on the, on the penstock that will further increase um, its efficiencies. Okay, I mentioned those five solar farms that we have online for a total of 10 megawatts. Um, we have six campus rooftop arrays for a uh, total of 100 kW. Um, in my experience, the rooftop arrays are as, as much trouble <laughs> and, and effort as the, as the larger um, uh, greenfield arrays. Happy to share stories after the fact. Um, but we now have the equivalent of 7% of Ithaca's, our Ithaca campus power generated by our solar, which is really the maximum possible under the regulatory framework on the distributed energy side. So things that we can do on our own land, connecting into the existing distribution system um, because of the way the regulations and tariffs are written, um, we'll now need to look to the larger scale renewables. But combined with our hydro plant, um, we're at about 10%. Um, and if we are successful with the community solar farm that's planned to um, be constructed this summer, that's another 18 megawatts. So that will triple our current Renewables. I'm really excited about that. Okay, 
but <laughs> there's still a really long way to go. Um, and I'm sorry, this is not meet the 18 point requirement that your professor warned me about, so I'll, I'll talk, talk you through it. Um, so this blue line represents our grid purchases of electricity, um, kind of moving from now to where we want to be at some point in the future, I guess 2035. Um, the green bars represent the kilowatt hours of renewable production. So we need ultimately our um, renewable production, whoops, sorry about that, to um, you know, match what we're currently getting from, from fossil fuels. So here's our hydro plant, um, here's solar farms number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, if our, our Dryden, if our community solar farm comes online, that'll give us a big boost. Um, we had hoped that the Black Oak wind farm would supply about 20% of campus power. Um, tragically, that project failed. Um, and then moving forward, we have sort of non-specific plans to be kind of opportunistic, pending what kind of incentives are available, um, what happens in the, the regulatory world, um, whether the steel and solar panel tariffs are lifted, what kind of impact those things have. So, Anyone, based on the numbers I've been throwing out, how many solar farms similar to our, our little two, K, two megawatt solar farms um, do you think we would need to supply all of campus power? Anyone have a guess? No guesses? Nothing. 105? Good guess, anyone higher or lower? Okay. 67, um, hopefully fewer if you all keep going with the energy conservation and managing your, your building energy uses appropriately. Okay, but what we do have planned um, in store, I talked about the Dryden Solar Farm that hopefully will be online by the end of this year. Um, and Cornell has just signed um, a letter of intent to participate in a consortium with about 25 other New York campuses, both SUNY and private schools to see if we can use our um, collective momentum and incentives to do a large aggregate renewables project. So that we have just, like I said, just signed the letter of intent, trying to pull ourselves together, find an energy consultant, but we hope to um, motivate the installation of several hundred megawatts of renewables by 2020. So that's sort of our next, our next big thing um, on, this, on this track to renewables. So starting to tackle this big bar here. Okay, so we've avoided, we've reduced, we've replaced. Um, there's a little bit left, right? Those emissions that we just can't eliminate. And those are primarily, uh, we are assuming, will be our commuting and air travel emissions by the time we get to 2035. So we are hopeful that our commuting footprint will decrease a little bit um, as folks um, shift to more sustainable modes of transportation, get out of your single occupancy vehicles. And I will say, I think something like north of 80% of students already get to campus by um, something other than a single occupied vehicle. Well done. Um, we're also looking for some increases in fuel efficiency and um, electric vehicles. Uh, maybe some more flexible work arrangements to help us reduce that commuting footprint. Uh, we're not anticipating that air travel emissions will decrease dramatically. Um, you know, the aviation industry is, is making some good strides, but where our assumption, at least for us getting to 2035, is that jet fuel will still be primarily fossil fuel based by 2035 and we'll need to offset those. As I mentioned before, um, we think about offsetting actions, um, things that are linked to our mission. Um, we have lots of folks interested in um, you know, carbon sequestration in soils um, or afforestation or you know, working with our community to help fund um, you know, lower middle income folks making improvements in their own homes. So no simple purchase of offsets. We are not gonna buy our way out. To summarize, <laughs> the plan at a very high level, um, you're familiar with pie charts. So this block is essentially a pie chart. It's based on actual um, reduction um, expectations from these various projects. And the whole block represents our current greenhouse gas emissions. So as we're, we're trying to, to block these out, our source heat, obviously, is a, a huge piece of that. Um, energy conservation and, and building energy standards, these are the piece and offsetting actions that's essentially our commuting 
in our air travel. Those are things where we all have a role to play in trying to block out those emissions. Um, <laughs> Here's our existing solar and our existing hydro. <laughs> We're starting to chip away at things. Um, here's what we hope to do um, with our larger scale wind, water, and solar projects. So that is the sort of the, the complete picture of um, how we're hoping to eliminate our inventory emissions. I see that I have five minutes left. I'm gonna take a quick diversion from Climate Action Plan and talk to you quickly about the broader campus sustainability plan. Um, it's written as a five-year plan, and we're right in the middle of updating it. Um, this is sort of the strategic goals inclusive of our carbon neutrality goal. Um, so just quickly, it covers, like our, our climate goal, the Ithaca campus and community, um, all students, faculty, and staff, um, maybe alum, maybe protect, prospective students. We're looking for input on that. Um, everyone's responsible, and everyone can participate in the plan. The PSCC group is overseeing the update and the um, publishing, but again, anyone can contribute and help refine the goals, and we hope that you do. Um, and the cool thing that we're doing this year that we've never done before is to set strategic goals beyond carbon reduction. It's kind of funny to think about that um, we're trying to do better with sustainability, but we haven't had sort of measurable targets around you know, water use, you know, land management, food, materials management, those kind of things. So we are trying to do things that are as visionary as carbon neutrality, things that are informed by science and capitalize on our own unique strengths. And those goals are sort of organized in the um, three draft aspirational statements that if we accomplish our sustainability plan, um, what change will we have made in the world? Um, so we want, the, we want to provide bold climate change leadership. We want to help drive a sustainable campus and region and we hope to have an engaged campus community. So a demonstrated culture of sustainability on campus through everyone's personal sort of leadership and behaviors. So why I'm telling you this, um, is that as we are developing goals to help us achieve those aspirations in four major target areas, so climate, campus operations, a campus community, and living laboratory, so these have been drafted by the members of the PSCC. We've held a number of um, campus informational sessions and open houses, but we really want everybody's input on these goals, um, whether it is, you know, um, you know, the language that you're using is not inclusive, or you, know, you left this, this big gap, um, you know, why don't we have a goal about campus water reduction, you know, those, those kind of things. We want, we sort of believe in the, the collective wisdom, and we know that there is a lot of expertise um, and a lot of, um, thoughtful folks on campus, and we want to hear from everybody. Um, so you can always give feedback online. The um, web instructions are here. And there are two um, campus open forums coming up. Um, okay, April 20th in Uris Library, and April 23rd in Mann Library from about 11 to 1. The details will be in the Cornell events calendar. I hope you will stop by um, or go online and, and give us some feedback on those. Just where does, where does Cornell stand um, in relation to the other um, 185 U.S. doctorate granting institutions um, who have set goals? Many of them haven't. There's only one other Ivy who's set a carbon neutrality goal um, publicly. Um, but of all of the institutions that have done this, um, there are eight that are hoping to achieve carbon neutrality by 2020. Um, the majority are out um, beyond 2050. So. Again, for context, our, our goal is 2035 um, or as soon as possible. It would be remiss not to point out that despite um, the challenges and what feels like incredibly slow incremental progress, um, we are actually um, the number one Ivy League institution leading in this area. Um, we're working really hard to um, bring new renewable generation online, to bring new ideas, new solutions, um, you know, rather than buy existing um, you know, existing power from wind farms out west or something like that. It's important to us to bring new generation online to try to really offset existing fossil fuel generation. It's, it's a little bit slow going, um, but we're proud of the fact that um, we are making progress. And I will um, close by borrowing from Bill Nye, who was on campus not too long ago and um, very optimistically <laughs> said that he really, uh, really believed Cornell and really it's just all of the very smart people here are going to save the world. So, 
that is the end of my remarks, and I hope you will join me in saving the world. <laughs>
understand what we're doing and are um, you know on board that it's that it's the right thing to do and are comfortable with the level of risk that it you know, either does or does not um, present depending on your perspective. Yeah, so that's kind of a chicken and egg question. Um, the first time you do anything is the most expensive and the most risky, um, whether um, sometimes they're directly dependent on one another. So um, we think we need something north of $10 million to get us to the first test well, depending how that goes, depending what we find, um, because it will be uh, less risky. <laughs> Um, will be easier to attract um, partners to, to carry things forward, and it should also be, um, you know, overall less expensive. You know, once we've done it before, you know, we'll improve processes and, and that kind of thing. Does that help? I hope so too. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, you know everyone has a different kind of personal style, and depending on what the the purpose and the you know the format of the event is, sometimes remote participation is more and less effective. Um, you know, oftentimes it is you know being together in the same space that you know kind of has that spark and generates the you know the next you know, the next great cold fusion or whatever technology. So I think that um, that's kind of a personal decision that, that we all need to make where it makes sense. Um, and you, it's the technology is there to do the remote participation. That's zero emissions. Um, there's also um, sort of nuance there, right? Maybe if you're going to New York City, um, the relative emissions of flying versus taking the campus to campus bus versus driving yourself, right? There are ways that we can um, you know, reduce the intensity of you know, carbon embedded in our travel as well. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> focus on um, electricity, because that's where I have the most um, personal experience. And I'm going to divide projects into those that we call DER, or distributed energy resources, that interconnect with the distribution system. So those are the, the wires that we see running down the sides of the road, versus large-scale renewables or utility-scale renewables that interconnect at the transmission um, or the wholesale level. So those are the big high power lines you see going over the hills. Okay. So um, all of our solar power to date is DER, so at the Distributed Energy Resource Scale. So working with the state's Public Service Commission, um, we understand that our existing distribution infrastructure is, you know, 100 years old or so, and it is really not designed um, for distributed generation, right? It's designed to have big central power generation, and then it goes out through the system, so the capacity of the wires and the substations gets smaller and smaller the further out in the system you go. So there are some technical challenges about what, um, you know, what 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 is safe. We have to, you know, study, and it costs a lot of money <laughs> to do the upgrades. Um, that's sometimes, um, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the project cost is just doing the upgrades to the distribution infrastructure. So there's that. Um, there's also the ability of our utilities, <laughs> you know, to, to manage and to um, cooperate, I guess, with our um, desire to, you know, move towards a, a carbon neutral future. So there are, um, right now, um, we've actually just been successful in raising the project size cap from two megawatts to five megawatts. We've worked with a coalition of folks across the state. So for a long time, you couldn't build a project bigger than two megawatts and interconnected on the distribution side. Um, technology, um, utility cooperation, and then concerns about rate impacts on non-participating customers. 
um, this one gets a little a little detailed, but if um, you know the folks who have the ability um, and the resources to put solar on their homes or power their institutions with solar are, are frequently not um, lower middle income folks, right? So as those folks are um, moving off the grid, the customers that are left then are having to bear um, a larger percentage of the, you know, the overall maintenance costs. So there's concern that we you know, do this transition in a way that is equitable to, to everyone. So those are some of the limits. Um, we've also run into, <laughs> um, let's see, uh, municipal permitting issues and uh, community concerns with renewables, be they um, you know, purely you know, visual or emotional or, you know, concerns about things being cited properly. Um, New York State is what's called a home rule state. So every little township and village um, has a board of volunteers that has to approve all of these projects. And sometimes um, folks are welcoming to renewables and sometimes they need to be convinced. Um, or there isn't a permitting process in place and we've run into that before too. Um, and there are then some questions about um, taxation, um, what happens if a nonprofit is partnering with a for-profit, um, and what does that do to the tax status? So, uh, there's lots of, lots of those kinds of um, uh, kind of under the fold questions and complications. Does that answer your Thank question? You. Any more questions? Okay, that's some um, thanks there again.